Greetings once again. This is the second message I've recorded in the midst of the current COVID-19 pandemic. I'm recording it for this Sunday, April uh, 5th. As I said last week, I am thankful for the opportunity to talk to you this way, given our current level of isolation. Last week, I spoke on an incident in Mark's Gospel in which Jesus' disciples, ordinary folk like you and me, were quite literally scared to death. As we saw, after a full day of ministering to the crowds, including miraculously feeding them with just a few loaves and fishes, Jesus sent his disciples across the Sea of Galilee while he went up on a mountain to pray. When a storm arose, such that the disciples despaired of drowning, we're told Jesus saw them struggling, and that after about six hours, he finally went out to them, walking on the water. Even then, it looked as though he intended to pass them by. And then seeing their terror, he steps into the boat, and the storm is stilled. As I said last week, that passage has a lot to say to you and me in the face of the current pandemic. My title was Peace in Place of Panic, because this is what Christ offers those whose trust is in him. I made the observation that whether Jesus was physically in the boat or not, storm or no storm, the disciples didn't need to fear. They had seen Jesus perform all manner of miracles, and they knew he could keep them safe in any storm. And that is the bottom line in our current situation. God is still watching over us, and though we may be tempted to despair, concluding that he doesn't care, if you're trusting him as your Savior and your Lord, you have nothing to fear. Not that the temptation to fret isn't real. These are certainly trying times. But the truth remains that God's power and presence and peace is still yours to claim as his child. And he goes with you, no matter how hard the journey fact is, Jesus didn't promise smooth sailing in this life. What he promises is a safe arrival. That's his promise to all who've placed their trust in him. Well, that was last week. This morning, still in the context of COVID-19, I want to look at an Old Testament story, one that shows how God works behind the scenes when we don't even think he's there. The title I've chosen for my message is Certain Faith in Uncertain Times. Before I get to the passage, let me give you a bit of context. See, at the start of this year, our congregation at St. Andrews Tilsonburg <coughs> embarked on a year-long study of the Bible entitled The Story. It covers the scriptures from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. We envisioned it taking 32 weeks. Of course, it's been pushed back a little bit now. Uh, the premise behind the story is that the Bible is not, as some think, a, a collection of disconnected pictures and stories. It's really a mural that tells a single story, a story that will change your life, the greatest story ever told. It's the story of redemption and reconciliation, big words meaning that God wants to be in relationship with you and me. That single story, what we might call God's upper story, unfolds while we each here live out our lower stories. And the perspective we need to keep especially in times like these, is that God is weaving all our lower stories, including not just those of David and Bathsheba and uh, Daniel and Peter and Paul and every other character in Scripture, but also your story and mine. He is weaving all our stories together to tell that one grand epic story from above, the upper story of God's love for us and his desire for us to enjoy an intimate relationship with him. That, friends, is his desire for you that you might know him and commune with him and experience the life-transforming joy of knowing your creator. He is the one who says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. He's offering to share your everyday life. As I say, he is weaving all our lore stories into his grand upper story. Our goal, then, is to align our story with God's story that we might walk with him in newness and fullness of life. Well, as our church family embarked on our journey through the scriptures, we looked first at creation and God walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, enjoying that relationship that God desires for you and me. Then came man's sin, breaking our fellowship with God, followed by man's decadence and the resultant flood. And though after that there was a fresh start of, sh of sorts, mankind didn't get any better. Still, God doesn't give up on man. And so he calls Abram, through whom he's going to build a special nation, set apart as his own, in a unique relationship with him. 
Along the way, God tests Abraham's devotion by telling him to go to Mount Moriah and sacrifice his son, the one Abraham had waited so long for. Thankfully, seeing Abraham's willingness to go through with it, God doesn't actually require that of him. Instead, God provides a ram as a substitute. In this, of course, we have a foreshadowing of the actual sacrifice that God will make of his own beloved son, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who will die in your place and mine on a mount called Calvary. It's no coincidence that Mount Calvary and Mount Moriah are one and the same. That foreshadowing is part of what we might call the scarlet thread of God's upper story that runs all through the lower stories of Scripture. That scarlet thread was actually there back in Genesis when God replaced the fig leaves that Adam and Eve have had used to cover their sin, covering them instead with animal skins, an early sign that blood would be required to cover their sin. Well, from Mount Moriah, we followed Abraham's descendants into slavery in Egypt. But then after 400 years, God speaks to Moses out of a burning bush and appoints him to lead the Israelites out of their bondage. After a series of plagues, most notably the death of every firstborn in Egypt, Pharaoh finally lets them go. And again we see a hint of the upper story, that scarlet thread as the angel of death passes over the homes of the Israelites whose doorposts have been marked with the blood of a lamb, once again foreshadowing our being spared God's wrath through Jesus' death as our Passover lamb. As we know, Jesus later infused that very meal with new meaning, pointing out how the Passover points to him and his sacrifice for us. And that, of course, is what the church will celebrate uh, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, whether we're in isolation or not. Well, after the Israelites were allowed to leave Egypt, we saw how God himself led them to the Promised Land. Along the way, they received some unique commandments, standards for God's chosen people that will mark them as his. They're also introduced to a covenant, a promise from God himself that he will watch over them as he establishes them as his people. When they finally take possession of the land, even then we again see the scarlet thread as the conquering army, in recognition of her helping two Hebrew spies, spares the prostitute Rahab and her family. How do the invaders know uh, to spare Rahab's family? She's instructed to hang a scarlet cord out the window of her home. Another hint at how God plans to bring us into his family. All of this is the backdrop to the text I want to consider with you today. It's the book of Ruth, which was actually the story our guest speaker, Reverend Doug Scott, spoke on just before we all went into lockdown. I'm revisiting that today because I've had such a strong sense this week that we need to hear it again and let it speak to us again. Because, as I said at the outset, as the story unfolds, it reveals how God works behind the scenes when we don't even think he's there. And so its message is so very pertinent in the face of the current COVID-19 pandemic that has rocked our world in so many ways. In the midst of the pandemic, you maybe have wondered if God is still there or ever was. I want to assure you that he is. Again, the title I've chosen for my message is Certain Faith in Uncertain Times. And these are without doubt uncertain and troubling times. And so as, as we revisit this amazing story of God's care in the midst of uncertainty, my hope is that, is that you will find the hope and reassurance that comes from knowing that God is still at work and that you'll be able to rest in the truth expressed in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Meaning that if you're trusting in God, he will take care of you. And in fact, as we read a few verses further on in that same book of Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That nothing includes coronavirus and all the other stuff that happens in our lives. And there's a lot of stuff. So what happens in the book of Ruth? Well, let me read some of the opening verses of chapter 1. In the days when the, fam when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. 
and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and without her husband. At this point, this is a pretty discouraging tale. I mean, the famine has been so severe in, in, in Bethlehem that this Jewish family, Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their sons, have done what so many migrants do these days. They've left all that is familiar and moved as refugees to the land of Moab, a foreign country not especially friendly toward Israel. They probably had to keep their heads down, as it were, perhaps the way illegal immigrants, uh, illegal aliens live in the U.S. Then, as we've read, the sons marry Moabite women, one named Orpah and one named Ruth. They're settling in. But ten years later, the women have conducted three funerals as Naomi's husband and two sons have died. Their world is in tatters. And then Naomi gets word that the famine is over back home and she decides to return to Bethlehem, at first with her daughters-in-law. This is what it says. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me. Even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. This last verse is one of the most beautiful verses of Scripture, as Ruth declares her allegiance to Naomi. It's an allegiance that God will honor. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. At this point, Ruth is taking a huge risk. She's leaving her country and her faith. She's not likely to find a husband in that new land. A land which, in that day and age, uh, meant then that as she was living there as a widow, uh, she would never have any status or means of livelihood. The famine may be over, but it's still going to be tough for both Ruth and Naomi. But as we'll see, God is at work behind the scenes. Well, Naomi and Ruth head for Bethlehem, and Naomi, who has felt that indescribable pain of losing her husband and both her sons, Naomi's under no illusions about their situation. A few verses further on, we read of their arrival in Bethlehem. It's a small town back then, perhaps 200 people. And the entire town is no doubt buzzing with Naomi's return. But she tells them, don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. She doesn't see God's hand at work. But though she doesn't see it in her present circumstances, it doesn't mean he's not working. The very next verse tells that, us that they arrived just as the barley harvest was taking place. And though they had no means of income, God had decreed that wealthy farmers were required to leave some of the grain on the land for the poor to gather up. 
the practice was called gleaning. So Naomi sends Ruth off to a nearby field to glean the scraps of grain left behind by the harvesters. This she does through the barley and the wheat harvest. And what she and Naomi didn't know was that this particular field was owned by a local farmer named Boaz. Now, if you think that God has been absent all through uh, the story of Ruth and Naomi's lives, you need to think again. Because God is weaving something here as part of his upper story, which, which is all about the redemption of the human race. It turns out that Boaz, the owner of the field, is a close relative of Naomi's late husband, Elimelech, and therefore a relative of their two sons. And there was another Old Testament law that required a near relative of a man who had died without any children to marry his widow in order to continue the family line. It's no coincidence that that relative was known as a kinsman redeemer. Redeemer being what Jesus would be for each of us. And so Boaz has an option to marry uh, Malon's widow, Ruth, which he willingly does. Thus she and Naomi are provided for. Boaz and Ruth even have a child, a son named Obed. Naomi may have thought God had given up on her when she changed her name from pleasant to bitter, but she was wrong. Now she has a new family and a new grandson. God has restored life to her. And so Naomi and Ruth's lower story has a happy ending. But there's more. And this is where the lower story merges with the upper story. Do you remember how, as I began my message, I, I mentioned a Canaanite prostitute named Rahab who had helped the spies just before the Israelites took over the promised land? She was the one who was spared by hanging a scarlet cord out her house window. Rahab eventually married an Israelite, and they had a son. Can you guess his name? It was Boaz. Boaz. God had been weaving his story through their stories. Oh, but there's more. Because Boaz's son with Ruth, Obed, was the father to a man named Jesse, who had become the father of a boy named David. We know him as King David, the greatest king of Israel. And from the line of David, many generations later, would come a child born in that same town in Bethlehem, the town of Boaz and Ruth, the city of David, in fulfillment of the prophecies that we quote every Christmas. And so Ruth the Moabite, along with her new mother-in-law, Rahab the Canaanite, end up in the lineage of Jesus, the Messiah, our kinsman redeemer, the one who redeems, that is, buys us back with his own blood on the cross. Buys us back that we might come into that relationship with our loving Heavenly Father. How amazing is the story God has been weaving and continues to weave in all our lower stories. Friends, the point I would draw from all of this is that even in the uncertainty and, of, uh, and the face of famine, and even in the face of our current uncertainty, know that there's this, a sovereign God at work behind the scenes. He was at work behind the scenes in Ruth's story, and he's at work behind the scenes in your story. Are you able to trust him for that? I hope you are. I hope you are. I quoted from Romans chapter 8 earlier, in which Paul writes that God works all things for our good, and that nothing, nothing being a coronavirus or anything else that threatens us, nothing can separate us from his love for us in Christ. Ruth's story makes that point. God can and will turn the impossible into reality and turn what seems to be bad into our good when we keep our eyes focused on him and keep our lives aligned with his upper story. In the hard times, we need to remember what God said through the prophet Isaiah. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts, and my ways are higher than your ways. So I encourage you to trust in God today. Ravi Zacharias tells the amazing story of Hien, a young Christian in Vietnam. And I close with this. As Ravi tells it, shortly after Vietnam fell, Hien was imprisoned on accusations of helping the Americans as a translator during the war. His jailers tried to indoctrinate him against the Christian faith that he had embraced. He was restricted to communist propaganda in French or Vietnamese, and, and the daily deluge of Mark and Engels began to take its toll. Maybe I've been lied to, he thought. Maybe God doesn't exist. Maybe the West has deceived me. So he had determined that when he awakened the next day, he would not pray anymore or think anymore of his faith. 
The next morning, he was assigned the dreaded chore of cleaning the prison latrines. As he cleaned out a tin can overflowing with toilet paper, his eye caught what seemed to be English printed on one piece of paper. He hurriedly grabbed it, washed it, and after his roommates had retired that night, he retrieved the paper and he read the words. Romans chapter 8. Trembling, he began to read. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. For I am convinced that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He unwept. He knew his Bible and knew that there was not a more relevant passage for one on the verge of surrender. He cried out to God, asking forgiveness, for this was to have been the first day that he would not pray. After finding the scripture, Hien asked the commander if he could clean the latrines regularly because he discovered that some official was using a Bible as toilet paper. And each day Hien, Hien picked up a portion of scripture, cleaned it off, and added it to his collection of nightly reading. What his tormentors were using for refuse, the scriptures could not be more treasured to Hien. Eventually he was released from prison and fled to Thailand. Today, he's a businessman in the U.S., a radiant Christian, and a living testimony to the truth of God's word and its transforming power. Friends, again, I quote Romans 8.28. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Or as C.S. Lewis puts it, God remains an active agent in the world and is able to incorporate even the things we assume bad into a greater plan. Though darkness be all around, please know that God is at work in these uncertain times. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you. You're a loving and gracious Lord. I thank you for your kindness, your mercy to us at all times. Thank you for the reminders again from your word that you are always at work and that even though we may not see your hand, you're still working all things for our good. Thank you that you're weaving and writing your upper story even through our lower stories. Thank you for the ultimate story of our redemption through Jesus, that you are our Redeemer. May we each find the faith to trust you for that. And may we also be able to trust you for the outcome in these uncertain times. May we know that you're still there. I pray that each one listening to this message may find their hope in you. Please take away our anxieties and replace them with your perfect peace perfect peace that we might then pass that peace on to others. Indeed, may we be sensitive to any around us who may be in any kind of material need as well as to those who may be distressed by the, the steady flow of disturbing headlines. Make us agents and instruments of the good news that flows from knowing you. We do continue to pray for healing for those afflicted by the virus and comfort for their loved ones. Please also protect those on the front lines in the battle, the, the medical professionals who are working such long hours to combat COVID-19, as well as emergency personnel, grocery workers, and others who are still potentially at risk. We thank you for them all. We remember as well those who are isolated, seniors especially, with families who are not able to, to be with them at this time. Please bring your comfort. All this we ask in your mighty in your precious name, Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, Carol is going to play the song, God Will Make a Way. The words say, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day, he will make a way. He will make a way. <laughs> 